Hello and welcome to Tales from the Ruther Library, a podcast coming from the Walter P. Ruther Library at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. I am Dan Galadner, your host today. You better listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear their voices still calling from across the years. And they're crying across the ocean. They're crying Dear friends, welcome to the Labor Radio Podcast Network series highlighting the work of our members. The growing network of over 70 shows in four countries serves as a one-stop shop for audiences looking for labor content and as a resource for labor broadcasters, podcasters, and content producers. My name is Evan Papp, and I produce Empathy Media Lab's podcast on labor, political economy, arts, and culture. We're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Today, I'm speaking with Dan Galadner from the Tales from the Ruther Library. So Dan, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what led you to organize labor. Well, thanks for having me on this. Um, I'm a little excited when you asked me to um, participate in this. Um, I grew up in the D.C. area, um, on the Virginia side of D.C., and um, raised there up to probably throughout high school, and then went to uh, colleges on the East Coast, ended up at Wayne State University for uh, graduate school, um, and from there, because everybody said, if you want to get into labor archives, you go to Wayne State University, so I did, and I've never been, never been to Detroit, so might as well travel over to the Midwest. Um, I was raised labor. Uh, my father worked in the AFL-CIO. My mom worked politics as well as other NGOs around the D.C. area. And listen, when I was told to sit at a table that said boycott cores when I was eight years old, I didn't ask. I just did. I didn't know what beer was, but you knew I knew it was bad. I didn't know what grapes were for a very long time. So I was raised labor through and through and still am. Very cool. Very cool. So what was the uh, Coors beer strike about? Uh, I mean, I know the Coors family is pretty anti-labor, but. Um, back in the 70s, uh, Coors tried to bust the union. They were never very friendly to the union. And they decided that they wanted to make sure that they didn't have any more unions there. They had been unions since the 50s, but they didn't want it anymore. They were also doing some very draconian things for the workers, like searching their lockers, uh, pre-interviews, post-interviews with the workers and saying, how do you vote? What is your sexuality? Where do you lean on this? Very violation stuff of the First Amendment. So they went on strike, and it was a nasty strike, of course. And the AFL-CIO called the nation nationwide boycott. And it wasn't for quite a long time afterwards. Well, maybe I would say about a good 10 years later. I could be wrong. Um, they brought in a piece. They said, okay, enough of this. Coors was losing money left and right, uh, losing, losing advertising. Uh, what's the interesting thing about the Coors boycott, it brought two communities together as well. It brought the uh, gay community in San Francisco um, along uh, uh, allies with the Teamsters because they said, listen, Coors is bad. It's not good union beer. And also they're discriminatory to our homosexuals. Teamsters said, we're with you brothers and sisters. So I brought those two together. So an interesting strike historically, um, and I still don't drink it. <laughs> so for those who may not be interested or aware of labor news, why do you think unions and organized labor are important and should be covered? And could you talk a little bit more about the work you're doing as a labor archivist? Oh, sure. Um, throughout labor history, we've always needed a communication tool, whether it was passing out flyers at the plant whether it was the newspapers that were developed, was it, whether it was um, during the, during the um, 30s and 40s, there was an actual network uh, kind of similar to the AP press, but it was a labor press that was sending materials out. So we always needed a form of communication. This is just another step into talking about things that does not get covered in the mainstream press. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, we really don't have any more labor writers anymore in the major newspapers. And the only way that people can find out about labor issues, workplace issues, OSHA issues, is we need to start listening to um, more labor press. And the labor radio network is that place for us. And one reason we started our podcast, uh, Tales from the Ruther, was not only to highlight our historical collections at the Ruther Library, but 
to remind people about the past and how, well, sometimes very bloody past labor came from and what they've done for American society. It's uh, another way to awaken people's senses of it was, just wasn't the bosses who gave us that contract. It was fought for, it was sometimes killed for, and that's why we are here. So who was Walter Ruther? <laughs> Walter Ruther was president of the United Auto Workers from the 19, late 1940s through his death in 1970. Um, he died in a plane crash flying up to Black Lake, Michigan. Um, way up here. I'm down here. Way up here. Um, um, he is uh, responsible for many reasons of being a very progressive union leader, responsible for building that middle class alongside with the steel workers and other union leaders, but he was the one that brought the auto workers into the middle class with uh, his demands in the 40s, late 40s, going to GM and Ford said, open your books. Let's see exactly what you have so we can talk honestly together. Um, very progressive. The UAW was right behind Martin Luther King with the March on Washington. Yes, it was organized by A. Phil Randolph and Bayard Rustin. But the UAW pumped tons of money into that. And you can see that he was the only union leader to speak at March on Washington. Um, also, he brought Cesar Chavez to the forefront. He brought the teachers to the forefront, whether with, is with money, with supporting their organizing drives in the 60s, or highlighting their causes within the UAW. So, Ruther was one of our great labor leaders that we always hold up in uh, high esteem. So, can you talk a little bit more about your show and why you wanted to start it? You've already mentioned a little bit about the need to have more uh, labor radio and what it's about and uh, just trying trying to educate others to uh, about what the show is about. Sure. Um, Tales from the Ruther came about from uh, sitting with my colleague Troy Eller English in the lunchroom one day and said, you know what, let's have some fun. We have all this equipment laying around that we don't use as much as we like to. So why don't we start a podcast? Well, of course, my idea was that we had to be revolutionary, have a lot of fun with labor history. Um, but some people said, you can do a podcast, but don't get too political. <laughs> kind of hard to do when you're talking labor history, though. So what we do is they'll highlight our collections. And at the Walter P. Ruther Library, we, we are the largest labor archive in the country. We have the collections of the IWW, UAW, SDIU, AFT, uh, farm workers, uh, SEIU, and it keeps going on and on. Um, so we are a one-stop shop for anybody doing labor history in the country. We also collect the modern labor, not, sorry. We also collect the modern Detroit history, the urban history of Detroit. They kind of connect together. So we have the records of the NAACP, the United Way. We have all these progressive uh, grassroots organizations papers that help form Detroit in um, these various ways, as well as, you know, documenting the, the pitfalls of what happened to Detroit. Um, once, once the auto industries were leaving, you know, we document that as well. And we also have the collections of Wayne State University, one of the oldest universities in Michigan. It was founded right after the Civil War. So all of these things kind of match, match together. So our show highlights these collections. Um, we have research, we mostly talk to researchers about what kind of papers they're working on, what books they're working on, whether it's about the university, whether it's on labor, or whether it's on urban history. And we also highlight sometimes our archivists who actually want to get on the mic and actually talk about their collections to tell you about, you know, the hidden things that you might not know about that entice people to come to, well, used to be able to come to Detroit, but this entice you to learn more about what we have. So when travel starts again, you want to come to the Ruther Library. So I'm a Michigan native. I've spent most of my uh, life there growing up. And uh, I remember field trips to go to see uh, Ford's museum and how how incredible Ford was as a human being and everything he did. And the more I started digging in, I, I produced a, a short little uh, film on the Detroit hunger strike and or hunger march and uh, massacre where uh, striking workers during the Great Depression um, was move, walking to the River Rouge plant and got mowed down. And uh, I connected to you through that and I, I started listening to one of your programs was talking about fascism in Michigan. Uh, could you talk about the roots of fascism in Michigan uh, in the 1930s and the connections with Ford and, and a lot of other major players at that time? 
Absolutely. And it seems to be rearing its ugly head every once in a while. We, we keep talking about it. Uh, we're going to have a show coming up soon um, about an author writing about immigration between Detroit and Windsor, uh, 1920s to the 1940s. And of course, these hate groups are part of that as well. Um, I'm going to step back in the little 1920s. It's really started in the early 1920s with uh, actually Henry Ford, who um, started his theories of anti-Semitism and publishing his, his words in his own newspaper. And you got to remember, Henry Ford was one of the, the richest men in Michigan. He basically owned Dearborn. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it was basically his town. And the newspaper was everywhere. And anti-Semitism was growing with his words. Um, in this episode you're talking about, uh, this, this, uh, the researcher was looking at the connection between Michigan and Germany in the 1920s and the rise of Nazism in Germany. And she associated and could see that they were following along right with Henry Ford was saying about Jewish people, that they were taking over the world. And they attribute Henry Ford to some of their ideas. Uh, a newspaper reporter actually from the Free Press, I think it was, was visiting Hitler um, after he became leader and noticed a picture of Henry Ford in his office. And he's asked him about it and he says, I admire him. That's how deep rooted it was. And it kept growing. Even in 1929 in Detroit, uh, a major uh, uh, political campaign for mayor was happening where actually one candidate was supported by the Klan. The Klan almost took over Detroit. <laughs> um, that's how severe it was. Um, it just has roots in here because not only is Detroit a mecca for industrialists who want to keep uh, power to themselves and one way to keep power is to produce hate, but you have so many immigrants coming in the 20s and 30s that they mistrust each other. And to mistrust each other, you use hate against each other. And one thing they use is also terrorism. And we in Michigan had a group called the Black Legion that thought the Klan was too soft. And they were doing terrorist uh, bombings of Catholic churches, union halls, um, intimidation of African-Americans and new immigrants, as well as Jewish Jews who've always been here for quite a while. Um, I don't know what to tell you, but it, it was a beating reading gown here. And it showed even today, we still have the Michigan militias strong. They try to kidnap the governor or their plans were to do that. Um, another person was just recently arrested holding a hate camp up in Michigan. I don't want to tell you about Michigan. You grew up here, you tell me. <laughs> I moved here. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there is there is a very right-wing element. Michigan's a very interesting state because you have the unions and you have a very large uh, Muslim community uh, from, and you also have Chaldeans and uh, a lot of people from, kind of the Near East, Middle East. And then you also have a very strong Christian conservative, um, you know, very pro-gun uh, supporting. Uh, and I, I don't even like calling some of these folks conservative. I, I would, I think they're better identified as reactionaries. Um, so the the point though of the Father Coughlin and uh, Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford Fascism was alive and well and growing in the United States under FDR. And so there was in some ways a two front war of fighting fascism and Nazism in Europe, but then also trying to ensure that these groups weren't going to take over the United States because they were looking to do that as well. Um, and I, I just really appreciate the history that you bring. And, and I'm, unfortunately, I, I went to grad school at University of Maryland down the road and there's the uh, George, uh, the Meany Center of Labor, and it's also an, another labor archives. And while I was at School of Public Policy, I was not aware of the, these archives and these archive. And I want to bring labor into more of these public policy schools. And uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how you connect um, the work that you're doing with other academic communities and, and trying to raise awareness with students who could really benefit from the work that you're doing. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, um, the podcast is a part of that. Uh, I try, we try to keep it, uh, it could easily be a highbrow academic, let's really dig, in, dig into the papers and the books that are in, but we try to keep it as light as possible for a wider audience. The purpose is to get this out to the general public. 
And I think that is working. We've been getting various uh, people contacting us saying, thanks for your email. And, and they're, they're, they're not in labor. They're not in high academia. They're sometimes uh, rank and file members of a union uh, or they're, they could be a high school student. We're also running, um, we just got a grant actually from the um, National Archives that I just got with a co colleague, Megan Courtney. We've been working with the College of Education at Wayne State University to um, expose pre-service teachers, those who are getting trained to be teachers, and expose them to archives. Now, yes, it's at the Ruther Library, and of course, we're introducing a lot of labor history with them, and also urban history, specifically toward the 1967 uprising. Um, I mean, that's some amazing stuff that we have here. But the hope is when they become teachers, they'll understand what an archive is. And they go teach in, let's say, Maryland, they'll know to contact their local archives. Could be the University of Maryland, could be the Meany Center materials. And they'll know how to use them and teach the children how to use primary documents and how to be able to use critical thinking, which is a major component of any kind of archive. So we do many different types, ranging from getting teachers and understanding what an archive is to the podcast. Uh, we have sometimes exhibits, and when the Ruther Library opens up again, I'm sure we'll have people come in. We don't know what that's going to look like. We have online exhibits as well. We have a biography exhibit of Walter Ruther. We have an exhibit about the uh, Memphis sanitation worker strike, 1968, where Martin Luther King was assassinated. But we focus in on the worker. We actually focus in that he arrived to help those people, the sanitation workers. Um, so that's what the exhibit's all about. So we try various different ways of getting our stuff out there. It's hard to break down this old broken down palace of the archive brick, but we try to get it out there. I would love to open up another front in labor agitation to force all of our grammar school, primary, secondary school curriculum and textbooks to really work with the labor archivists around the United States to ensure that labor history is properly taught uh, from a young age through high school and into college and to understand the, the role of the worker in, in actually producing value in this country. And, uh, and, and why not use uh, some federal funds of these bailouts into, from the archives into uh, labor archivist uh, centers like uh, you're managing as well. That'd be awesome. Because remember when we were in high school, I think the only image I saw was Haymarket and the Flint sit down. Every image there just looked like violence. That's all we, you know, and that was it. That was labor history. Yeah. Those so, damn anarchists uh, throwing bombs that weren't ever really proven that well. So that's right. And they didn't really talk about how the Flint sit downs was actually the populace taking over the plants and saying, we want a fair wage. And they won. You know, I don't rem I didn't know they won when I was in high school. It was a picture. And we moved on to FDR in a chair. You know, <laughs> so we can do it. We can do it. So looking at the Labor Radio Podcast Network as a member of this network, how did you hear about it? Uh, what was the process of joining and why do you think this network is important? Um, I think I heard about it was various emails just being linked in with the labor community and signing up for every single listserv out there and finally one popped up and you know I think it was a blessing in disguise for the, the corona pandemic because we were all home. And before that, we were all busy putting our shows together and then moving on to other things we had to do. But sitting at home, uh, we were still trying to produce our shows, but we didn't have as much running around. And I think that's what, um, I think it got us really going because we were all sitting there looking for something to do. We were communicated through Zoom and then it just spiraled from there. It just spiraled from there. Um, what was the other parts of the question? Yeah, and, and why do you think it's important? Okay. Um, and since the spiral, the spiral from there became a bigger, bigger thing now, some, you know, the labor you know, radio network is huge now. And it's important because what, that, what we're trying to do is open the eyes, not only just with the labor news, and news is constantly going on, with, and it gives, a, it gives a spin of not just the, the usual politics, but the spin of how labor looks at it, how the working man and woman look at it. And what organizing things are happening? People always think it's like, oh, the union's organizing here, a union's organizing there. But with this labor action network, we are getting into the nitty gritty of how it's done. And people can realize that. And there's also the history shows like mine and a few others out there 
um, they're also just talking about here's the past, this is where we've come from. So the combination of the two, where we've been, the present, we are going to bring it into the future as well. And just you know, combine people together. It's basically that the old thing goes. It's solidarity. And with that solidarity, we are bringing a great message out to the populace. So in closing, looking into the future of organized labor, where do you see opportunity and hope? Uh, vote Biden. <laughs> um, where do I see opportunity and hope? Oh man, that's a tough one, seriously. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe it does. I, I think it absolutely has to ha begin with the Joe Biden uh, presidency because we're, we're going to be on the defensive um, without such a victory. All right. I, I got an answer. I got one. Okay. I got it now. Um, obviously, uh, the hope for the future is to, to vote Biden. And one thing that I, I you know, I, I've seen politics for a long time. And a lot of Democratic candidates promise things to labor and they never come through. But I have hope for this one because so much damage has been to, done to us through the NLRB through the imaging of what labor is and the fighting against it. But the people have been hitting the streets harder and harder than ever before. And when Biden was putting his, his programs together, um, he just didn't keep it his people. He brought Bernie Sanders people in. And on both sides, the Bernie Sanders side and the Biden side, bringing, bringing the Democratic platforms together, there was labor. Labor was there and represented it in very high level discussions. So I am very confident and hopeful of what's going to happen in the next couple of years. You better listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear there are voices still calling from across the years. And they're crying across the ocean, they're crying across the land, and they will until we all come to understand. None of us are free, none of us are free. Darkness, they just can't see the light if we don't.